uh, there are like uh, three years gap uh, between when uh, I started Bug Bounty and when I started uh, getting money from Bug Bounty. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Awesome. Hey, Sergey, how's it going? Hello. Very good. Awesome. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, Sergey Toshin, aka Baggy Pro. Uh, he's one of the big mobile hackers uh, in the scene. And uh, today we're going to be sitting down, just me and him, to have a little discussion about uh, mobile hacking and um, what led you on your path and all, all sorts of things. So um, why don't you go ahead and give a little introduction? Um. I'm Baggy Pro. Uh, like some time ago, I was number one hacker in Google Play Security Rewards program. Um, in the past year, I'm number hacker in Samsung B B Bug Bounty program. And I'm also uh, the founder of Oversecured. It's uh, mobile scanners for Android and for iOS applications. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to talk about all those different things. I, I, have, I have some notes written here, so uh, I'm excited to, to pick each of those apart. But why don't we, uh, why don't we just get started with um, sort of like how you even got into mobile hacking because uh, I'm a mobile hacker myself and there's really not a ton of us or if there are, we're, we're very uh, quiet and in the shadows sort of types of things. So uh, what was sort of your introduction into mobile hacking? How did you how did you get started? That's actually weird and I didn't plan this and I had no any experience with mobile hacking. But when I was uh, 18, uh, I was a student in a university. I was studying math and uh, like uh, uh, low level uh, programming, like assembler programming and so on. And when I was uh, in school, I was working for American company as a QA engineer. And um, I wanted to find uh, like a job, not for money, not because of money, but uh, to get some experience, like real practice. Um, and uh, I was looking for a job. Uh, I was uh, coming to co-engineer uh, interviews. I was coming to uh, like C++ programming uh, interviews. And my actual uh, resume was about uh, junior C++ developer. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, and I was clicking like everywhere, uh, like uh, come to interview, come to interview, and uh, companies uh, were replying to me. And some company uh, they had uh, like three jobs: it's uh, Unix uh, security guy, uh, mobile security guy, and uh, like web security guy. And I clicked uh, okay. like I want to be Unix security guy because it looks uh, it looked like more hard, <laughs> and that's why I picked this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they called me, uh, they told they liked my resume and uh, they want me to come to their office. And uh, they asked, I believe, uh, like, uh, what do you want to do? I told Unix uh, security. Uh, they told no, uh, but uh, <laughs> they want to pick me for mobile security. And that's how I started working in mobile security. Oh, wow. Okay, so like a totally, completely, literally, like almost by chance. Yes. <laughs> Wow. Okay. And so you did that for, I assume, a, a number of years. And then di when did you find Bug Bounty? Um, so actually, um, this company was doing uh, uh, like consulting and selling the security products. And um, like uh, all of uh, my friends in the company, like colleagues, they were doing Bug Bounty and like oh. their, their salary was like one or two thousand dollars per month, but they were getting like ten thousand dollars per month for bug bounties, and they wow. worked uh, in the office uh, ju just because of community. And I said, "Oh, mm. I want this," but uh, I was like eighteen years old, and I had no idea how to get money from bug bounties, and that's why I was trying like uh, ten times, twenty times until it uh, succeeded. Oh wow! Okay, that's crazy. So, do any of those people still hack, and were they? Also, mobile hackers, or did they do they do uh, different no, types they, of No, they like web hackers. Uh, so actually, I believe uh, the most of people they hunt for like a specific vulnerability category. For example, XSS or browsers or mobile browsers, um, and so on. I know people that that uh, hunt for XXA only. <laughs> so mm, okay. I was uh, hunting for mobile bugs. 
Wow, that's really interesting. Okay, so you 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 know you knew these coworkers. They were doing bug bounty. They encouraged you. I had a very similar experience as well, where uh, one of my coworkers was somebody who did bug bounty, and they were like, "Hey, you should you should try this bug bounty thing out." And I was like, "Oh, okay, that looks interesting." Yep, but um, it doesn't work immediately because uh, I was coming to different bug bounties. First of all, I had no any experience. Second of all. Um, like in 2015, companies uh, didn't uh, believe that mobile bugs exist. <laughs> and that's why I, I, I'm submitting a vulnerability and they say it's not a vulnerability. <laughs> so true. Oh, man. This is like, uh, I, I talk about this a little bit, but yeah, this is this was something that honestly, only over the last couple of years, like maybe the last five years, has it really started to change a lot where yeah. the like risk assessment for mobile bugs has gotten a lot better because... It, for the longest time, they were just like, oh, you, you can't exploit this because you would have to be on the device or you'd have to have physical proximity to the device yes. or stuff like that. And then it was like, you know, yes, but there, that is a non like that happens now. Like, where, you know, malware is a real thing. Like people install random apps from the Internet all the time. So it's not like a non zero scenario where it can't happen. Yeah, because um, there are like a number of attack vectors, for example, are completely remote, like uh, from local network. Uh, from physical closeness, uh, from physical access to the device, and from local access. Yes, it's not a P one, but it's a vulnerability anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you then started doing bug, bug bounty, and were you always doing the Google VRP, or what? What ended up getting you to the number one spot there? I oh, know. <laughs> so uh, there are like uh, three years gap uh, between when uh, I started bug bounty and when I started uh, getting money from bug bounties. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yes, in summertime, I got a visit to the US, and that's why I wanted to visit. Uh, I wanted uh, to rent a Mustang, uh, Mustang convertible, GT Mustang nice. convertible. And it was like uh, pretty expensive. And as a student, uh, I didn't have enough of money to like afford it. And that's why I thought, like, bug bounty, let's try again. And before that, I submitted like 20 vulnerabilities that got rated as uh, not a security vulnerability. <laughs> and I really tried, like I was submitting like a lot of vulnerabilities. I was describing them they carefully and uh, it worked. I remember a vulnerability in Jira. It's, uh, it was using uh, an SDK that was vulnerable to that theft of arbitrary files. And uh, I submitted it to Quora. It's disclosed in my hacker one profile. I submitted it to Jira. They fixed it. And uh, like from only w one, this specific vulnerability I got like uh, ten thousand dollars, and it was yeah, wow. I have enough of money from one <laughs> vulnerability <laughs> to afford my trip and everything else. Now you can rent the bus thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. It's all about setting goals, you know. I, I I love that. I love just like having a specific goal in mind, and then you just like focus on that and just like hone in your energy all towards that one thing. Yeah, because uh, if, if it didn't work, I had to rent, uh, I don't know, Hyundai. <laughs> oh, no, cool. yeah, we can't, <laughs> can't be doing that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so you mentioned uh, you mentioned that you're the number one hacker on Samsung right now. Is that is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about that, because Samsung is, uh, I don't think I've actually ever hacked on Samsung, and they run an independent program, right? It's like totally yep. operated by them. So yep. what what is uh what, what what was that process like? What led you to start hacking so much on Samsung, and uh, what are sort of the pros and cons of working directly with a company like that? Actually, it was uh, like super random because uh, I had my I have like uh, in my life uh, I'm, I'm using iPhones, but uh, I also have Android devices and like to test vulnerabilities and so on. And I'm using a uh, Samsung for this purpose, and um, I thought like. Yes, I'm not using it like every day, but uh, I still use Samsung and that's why it's a good target, first of all. And second of all, um, I had no idea about uh, fragmentation in uh, Android vendors, but it appeared that uh, Android devices are completely different. If you take a Pixel device, if you take a Samsung device, if you take uh, like a Xiaomi device, they're completely different from uh, like vulnerabilities perspective. And that's why I was curious, uh, like, uh, as there are any vulnerabilities, but it appears there are a lot of them, like device specific vulnerabilities or vendor specific mm. vulnerabilities. Uh, do you find it difficult to sort of work with that attack service, or did you originally find it difficult? Because I imagine as you're uh, trying to hack something like P 
Pixel or Samsung, like the, the scope changes quite a bit. And also those attack vectors change quite a bit where you have to start thinking about the threat model differently, sort of from like a, a more of a consumer perspective, right? Where uh, what are the vulnerabilities within the system as a whole that you can exploit uh, versus just like specific applications or specific scenarios? Um, so how Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, you have like a long question, but the answer is no. Uh, everything is simpler <laughs> because uh, the applications are written uh, in Java, not in Kotlin, and uh, there are no any application, and that's why it's much right. easier to hunt for vulnerabilities. Okay, that wow, that is <laughs> <laughs> not what I was expecting actually. <laughs> so, so for some context for like people who are listening, um, uh, I think a lot of people may be unfamiliar with this, but most apps uh, nowadays, I'd say probably. I don't know, at least 30% are written in Kotlin, right? Um, so I believe for like uh, 80% of applications, they, they are mixed, uh, they are Java and uh, Kotlin based. Mm-hmm. So I'm talking about like a big, uh, modern, rich applications. Yeah. For example, Airbnb, uh, Tinder, uh, Google and uh, all like popular applications, uh, and uh, they rewrite their applications in Kotlin and use Kotlin features. And when they obfuscate Kotlin, it's like a complete mess. Yeah, have you, I've noticed. So I've noticed that you're quite active on the Jadex <laughs> project. <laughs> uh, I don't know if other people have noticed that, but uh, is that something that you use pretty frequently? Yeah, and actually. Uh, this tool is used by the scanner, and uh, it's like super important if uh, everything is correctly uh, decompiled. Like, uh, if the code is obfuscated, it's okay, but it should be like uh, compilable. Uh, there should be like correct references, and uh, because finding a vulnerability, it's like a number of uh, of actions of event uh, of events, and uh, like the code code flow should be like super correct. And if it's not correct, uh, like uh, one of a uh, hundred of uh, uh, like important code lines is uh, uh, corrupted, uh, the vulnerability will, <coughs> will be missed. And, and that's mm. why I'm pinging like a Jadix developer, like, hey guy, <laughs> please fix this uh, specific, <laughs> this specific error because <laughs> because of this uh, I cannot detect a vulnerability. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. I, that's exactly what I've noticed. Is like I'll be hacking on something, and I'll I'll have some like weird behavior in Jadex, and I I also use Jadex as my main decompiler, but I don't do the same automated level of scanning that you do. However, when something fails to decompile, oftentimes I'll go and I'll look, and I'll see either you have a ticket open for it for yeah. him to fix, <laughs> or it's just been fixed, and I need to update my version of Jadex. So it's really uh, it's really an awesome thing to see where someone from the community is interacting back and forth with the tool creator to actually improve the tool in real time. Yeah, I'm actually feel always like, um, I don't know, uh, the correct word, uh, not angry, but no. When some guys report uh, vulnerabilities <laughs> about uh, UI issues, like uh, <laughs> like the menu is not correct. And I'm thinking it's like open source project and the guy could be working on uh, like the compilation vulnerabilities, but he's working. <laughs> <laughs> He's working on UI issues. Why? Why you care about this? <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of the UI, do you do you use like when you use Jadex? Um, I guess maybe let, let let me split this into two questions. So uh, let's say for your personal hacking, not over secured like uh, automatic automatic flow, are you using Jadex when you decompile apps? Just generally across the board? Of course, like only okay. Jadex, and I never tried any other decompilers. Cool. And then are you using the GUI much or do you open it in like a separate editor? Maybe maybe we can you can walk me through sort of what your hacking flow looks like if you're approaching like just a one-off mobile app. So actually, first of all, I'm scanning the application using OverSecure it and then I'm uh, looking for vulnerabilities uh, uh, that it found. And okay. um, I didn't do like manual uh, review. Like sometimes I need to cover like all the vulnerabilities. Like uh, it's our customer and we need to verify, like manually verify if uh, everything is correct, uh, no vulnerabilities are missed. And that's why I'm coming, uh, like uh, checking everything is correct. Uh, no like uh, corrupted code flows, no uh, decompilation issues. And uh, yeah, I'm like uh, checking all exported components. 
Uh, I'm checking like clipboard, uh, notification handling, uh, like everything, uh, like everything. local web services, uh, uh, web servers, and so on. Got but it. Uh, like if I'm manually hacking just for fun or just because I didn't hack for a long time and I want to come back to my roots, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, like... Uh, Checking it using over security and then I'm opening it uh, in Jadix uh, UI. V, v, uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. It yeah. Be, so it so could it, be like a simple vulnerability and I don't open uh, Jadix uh, at all. But sometimes if it's a tricky vulnerability, there are like uh, tricky conditions. I'm opening it in uh, Jadix, yes. Got it. Okay. So why don't you tell me, we've talked about oversecured, we mentioned it a couple of times, but why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because it sounds like generally, as you were doing hacking, it was sort of a natural progression to create the product and company that oversecured is, right? Yeah. So uh, I was doing bug bounty hacking and uh, I was uh, looking for vulnerabilities in many applications and I was uh, like lazy to do everything uh, once again manually because there are like, uh, 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 like uh, thousands of files and uh, I need to like again and again uh, go through like uh, all the sources, uh, grab uh, the same stuff and it was like super boring to do that like manually and that's why uh, I created a tool and it was getting better, better and better and in 2019, Google launched uh, its uh, bug bounty program that called the Google Play Security Rewards Program. And uh, mm -hmm. I became like a number one hacker in this program because they started paying like $3,000 for every vulnerability found in a super popular application. And mm -hmm. like uh, Google guys was asking me, like, what do you think about this? <laughs> like uh, before that. Uh, because before this, that introduction, uh, they had like uh, 15 applications in scope and uh, they were asking me like, how do you think we should uh, extend our program? And I, I told, maybe we need to add uh, vendors like Google apps, all Google apps or someone else like Samsung apps. Um, and they told me adding like uh, all applications that uh, have a uh, hundred million of its installations and we <laughs> increasing <laughs> rewards three times. I told uh, guys, you're going to bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> but they That's didn't crazy. believe me. Yep. And uh, uh, I like started reporting a lot of vulnerabilities and they started paying a lot and uh, like... Uh, <laughs> Saying like uh, privately, they, uh, they <laughs> told we were, like it was our mistake that we uh, started paying like three thousand dollars, and right now they're paying one thousand dollars for such vulnerabilities. Yeah, it's true. I noticed that they <laughs> that they dropped it down after they uh, yeah. after a little while after <laughs> after you had farmed them like crazy. <laughs> that that's really really crazy. So for those who don't know. Uh, you know, VRP basically said any application that was, what was it, over 1 million installs or something um, like that, 10 million installs? A uh, hundred million. In hundred million. There are like uh, 500 of such applications. Right. So basically any vulnerability that affects any of those applications, Google Vulnerability Rewards Program would yeah. pay you an additional bounty, even if you reported it to the original app, right? Yeah. So actually, um, I didn't like reporting it to the developer because uh, there was a policy that uh, was saying like uh, if uh, a company has a bug bounty or vulnerability disclosure program, you need to report uh, it to them first, wait until it's fixed. And it, it was taking like months uh, until you get reward. And uh, that's why reporting it uh, like directly to Google, it's like uh, more mm. profitable because you get a reward within, I don't know, like two weeks. And you're not mm -hmm. waiting, you're not uh, having like a backlog of uh, vulnerabilities, you're not tracking. Because um, I cannot say like I had a good experience with developers because they like don't care. And uh, Google uh, like uh, pushing on developers and forcing them to fix a vulnerability. But when you as a researcher reporting it to a developer, they like don't care. And they say like, okay, we're fixing it. But actually they're not fixing it or they will be fixing it after a year. So it's like right. uh, very annoying. And uh, I like reporting uh, vulnerabilities to Google. Hmm. So uh, when you, 
but you find bugs in apps that are in that you know 500 plus cohort now do you report it directly to the company or do you still report it directly to google or what what does the process look like now so you uh you have to google if uh, the company has a, a bounty or vdp program and if they has you report it directly to them if uh, they don't you report it to google and they start their own process of validation uh, and uh, rewarding you for this. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, would you say that like a lot of the peop- the the companies and apps that you were finding a lot of bugs on that you've now signed them as <laughs> clients onto Oversecured? Actually, not all all of them because uh, uh, this program was only a push to start the company because. Uh, I have I had like uh, friends that started their own companies in cybersecurity, and uh, they were pinging me like saying like you have good scanner, you have a good business idea, so start your company. Yeah. And I was like uh, starting a company. It's like uh, where like uh, med- paying taxes. Like how it does it work? Yeah, like, corporate <laughs> taxes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when Google rewarded me, like uh, within I believe four or five months of work within almost a million of dollars. I started like, oh yeah, like everyone is vulnerable. I got the confirmation, like even super popular apps are vulnerable. And right now I have money to uh, start my company, fund everything by myself, uh, bootstrap it. And um, I did it. I came to America, <laughs> opened a bank account, uh, registered the company, and <laughs> wow. right now we're a Delaware-based company. Oh, that's amazing. That I mean, you really... It, it's awesome to see. I love seeing when bug bounty hunters especially, but generally just security researchers are able to turn one of their like personal toolings into a company like this because there's so many smart people who are building so many awesome security-related products. And a lot of the time, it's just for like personal use, just like what you were doing. Like this was just to save time and effort uh, by making your scanning a lot easier so that you could just throw in an app and do all your checks at one time. And you could just turn that into a product and help other companies, you know, automatically just they sign up and they pay you and and get that coverage. Yeah, but actually I had no any idea like uh, how business works. Uh, (laughs) And (laughs) it appears that selling to... B2B is like super hard because even if you like uh, com- completely disrupt a company, if you like uh, give them a good uh, report, uh, they fix uh, the vulnerabilities, they say thank you, hallelujah, like you said, I love our lives. <laughs> anyway, they need uh, budgets like for your tool and you need to talk uh, and it- it's, it doesn't happen immediately. Like uh, if you hack them this year, maybe in next year they assign budgets uh, like to buy your tool. <laughs> so oh, wow. It's like super long process. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Almost like the triage process <laughs> where you're waiting for yeah. bounties. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so uh, you had mentioned that uh, you disclosed the reports. And um, I think one of those that I, I have bookmarked and I go back to all the time is uh, this this uh, this report that you call, I think it's Golden Android Techniques for URL pi- uh, parsing bypasses or yep. something like that. Um, c- what made you want to publish that? Because that is just such an awesome resource. For people who don't know, this is uh, essentially, I think it's four different, um, three or four different tricks that you, you know, publish for how uh, Android will be parsing URLs or oftentimes apps will implement parsing URLs that are, implicitly vulnerable to parsing problems where you can either pass in a different host or if they do you know dot get host then it'll respond with a different host but if they were to do a string check then it's different and so um i think those are really really awesome checks because i i reference them all the time but what made you want to publish that because this was many years ago right this was 2018 um so i think you were quite ahead of sort of the the mobile security publishing curve at that point yeah, actually, this uh, this is uh, reposted in uh, our blog, in uh, our secure blog. I, uh, I believe the article is uh, like um, attack vectors on the view or something like that. So there are like uh, extended techniques and uh, extended ways of hacking, of securing. Yeah. But um, 
I always publish. Like, I don't have any like hidden knowledge that I use <laughs> when it's dark. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got yeah. your secrets, <laughs> your secret yeah, script folder. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't actually have any hacking secrets. Um, and uh, I always uh, published everything I know. Like, uh, maybe I know a way of uh, hacking something, but it's like uh, super small to publish. Uh, and it's super small for, for an article, but um, I always uh, post it everything I know, if it's if I consider it interesting, because um, I think it's like uh, good for our world because uh, like there are only a few mobile hackers and I have like uh, uh, I don't know a uh, hundred points in mobile hacking, uh, so I can uh, push someone else like uh, to I don't know twenty or to fifty or to maybe a <laughs> hundred and fifty. If, uh, they didn't That's know an awesome the, way to, to talk about it. Yeah, because like uh, companies, they don't know about uh, mobile vulnerabilities. And when I disclose reports, I like uh, push them. And uh, I believe uh, they uh, started to know that th there are mobile bugs and uh, how they look like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think so many people see mobile as sort of just another proxy for API hacking or, or web hacking, where yeah. they just use it to get endpoints yeah, yeah, exactly. and that's kind of it and that, that that's cool like you know uh, uh, that is there are certainly vulnerabilities there but I, I think there's just so much more depth when you're going to the real like the level that you and i often go to where it's you're looking for activities you're looking for intents you're looking for uh, providers and, and and all sorts of different like android specific components to find those real like android specific vulnerabilities um that provide so much more impact than just you know finding an idor or, or whatever well not always but <laughs> oftentimes <laughs> That's cool. Um, yeah. And so you mentioned your uh, the oversecured blog posts. Uh, this is another thing. I have a bunch of these bookmarked. Um, I've actually used oversecured a couple times to scan apps. And one of the things I really like is that it will link out to the different blog posts about different findings that it has. So if it finds, uh, you know, access to app protected components, it'll say, hey, here's a link to the blog post where you can read all about in depth, you know, what does this look like? Uh, you know, what does uh, an exploit scenario look like? How can you identify these types of things? What's actually going wrong? How can you fix it? Like, it's a huge, huge resource. Um, have you found that uh, there are things that you end up referencing in your own blog posts while, while you're hacking? Or is that sort of just something that you've written down and published and just goes out there? Um, so all the blog posts, uh, they're like results of uh, hacking and uh, I like uh, hack, uh, like previously I was hacking like a number of applications and I was looking like common, uh, like uh, common patterns of vulnerabilities. And uh, I created like uh, rules uh, for detection and uh, then I started detecting it. And right now I'm like extending and extending and extending uh, uh, the rule base. And uh, like uh, right now I'm uh, hunting for uh, like a new uh, vulnerability patterns because uh, like, uh, don't know any other uh, patterns and that's why I like uh, taking the sources, uh, checking it, uh, everything, <laughs> if it was your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, totally. I, I was going to ask something about this as well because I think one of the things that I felt as well is that over time, uh, mobile hacking, like there's, there's not many new vulnerabilities that I see coming up. It's a lot of the same types of patterns and the same types of vulnerabilities that are appearing again and again. Have you noticed any new common issues or things that you are seeing a lot more now that you didn't used to see? Or is it kind of a lot of the same? Mm, I think I did uh, the last uh, vulnerability like a uh, category about uh, two years ago in uh, Android. And for iOS, I'm like, uh, it's like a, a big uh, sphere. I'm like r right now researching and I'm like actively adding new categories to iOS because uh, it's like a researched sphere. But uh, coming back to Android, uh, um, so it, I think everything is linked because uh, like you have uh, your, your, your eye parsing and uh, <clears throat> maybe like uh, your new research gives you like a new way to hack your eye parsing or like uh, bypass some checks and uh, so on. And uh, that's why like there, there are existing articles, there are existing researchers and there are existing posted vulnerabilities about, like, for example, your eye parsing, but uh, you find like a, well, 
I don't know, a backslash attack. <laughs> and uh, it's like a, a new research and yeah. you're bypassing a, a lot of new checks. And it's like a, a type uh, of uh, like old attack, but uh, it's like a new attack. And uh, like the, the, the answer, because it was yeah, researched yeah. previously, uh, there are like uh, existing categories, but it's like, uh, anyway, it's new. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like a lot of that, like now, as you've continued to go, you've sort of branched into that the iOS sphere now, just because it's a whole new space. It's a whole new yep. area of research. It's all new, you know, everything. Have you found that a lot of things that worked on Android also have sort of like a parallel into iOS or so they work there, but in a different way? Um, I believe there are like uh, 80% of uh, intersected categories in Android and iOS, but uh, the biggest problem of uh, Android like previously, and the biggest uh, problem of iOS right now is uh, that there are like two types of iOS security. Uh, first uh, type uh, of iOS security is like an uh, NCO group that uh, they hack like everything in, into the system of building chains, decompiling everything, uh, reversing uh, like uh, assemblers. And the second type uh, of iOS security, it's like uh, uh, running an application an emulator, checking like uh, uh, keychain flux and so on. <laughs> and there should be like <laughs> a, like a different, like uh, the right uh, type of uh, yes, uh, security that uh, like doing uh, like normal vulnerability tracing, checking deep links. It's not like a, a super critical vulnerability that uh, giving you uh, a root on the device, but anyway, you need to protect uh, the application and you need to do it like uh, more deeply. Yeah. Okay. And have you have you done any of that like deep level decompiling type of research on iOS? Because when I think about iOS hacking, I think that there's a really large section of it that is essentially zero day research and looking for bugs that can be used for jailbreaking the system because it's not root like it's not easy to root it by default. Is that something that you've spent any time looking at, or is it primarily the applications themselves? So actually, we not decompile it. Decompiling it. Because there's no like a good way to get uh, sources from iOS application, and that's why, with, for example, with our customers, we go in with Android, uh, and then we say like we also uh, secure iOS applications, and we sign like NDAs, a given sources, and uh, mm. they like uh, super, I don't know, afraid to give sources because uh, they say like <laughs> we never did that before, but I say of like. Uh, Okay, your Android application, it's not obfuscated. It's like, uh, by default, it's open source. <laughs> your Android application, and what's the matter to deal with iOS? <laughs> I, love, I love that that strat because, like, so many people don't realize that you can just decompile an Android app. That's actually one of the things that I love the most about Android app hacking is I'm like a real, I'm a source code person. I like reading the code and understanding how it works and having it all right in front of me in like an application that you can just take apart. You know how everything works. There's no black magic. It's just what you see is what you get. I, I love that approach to hacking. Uh, and that's always one of the things that's really like pushed me away from iOS is that you don't get that same level of, you know, understanding and readability. It, a lot, it's so much more obfuscated. You have to do, you know, a read assembly and, and all, all this stuff. Um, has that been a challenge for you as well when when moving into the iOS space? Um, so, actually, I didn't uh, hack like uh, pure IPA applications. Like, I'm not taking I never took an IPA file and uh, checked yeah. for, for vulnerabilities. Uh, normally, I took, for example, Android application, checked like uh, deep links, and then I try to apply them to the iOS application, and sometimes it worked. Like, uh, there's a secure, uh, secure check in the Android application, but uh, there are no checks in the iOS application. And this kind of, for <laughs> example, I hacked iOS applications. And the second vector is uh, like, uh, 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 I, I took uh, sources and uh, like uh, checked for vulnerabilities, adopted the scanner to it, and <laughs> that's how like uh, it worked. But it's it, really it. a big problem for us, like uh, as uh, for a company securing iOS applications, like uh, we because we when we develop a scanner for <clears throat> Android, we like taking a lot of applications. We can uh, analyze. We can get statistics. Uh, we can check how like some speed like like new experimental rule, uh, rules work. What's the output? But in iOS we cannot do the same, and that's why we like uh, 
uh, asking our customers, "Hello guys, uh, are you okay to like uh, like we don't store sources, and that's why uh, uh, they need to like share sources uh, uh, like uh, via mail or via a link with us, and that's why we analyzing it uh, and like adding rules, checking if." if uh, something is wrong and there are like undetected vulnerabilities. Yeah. So it's harder with iOS. Mm, mm, that's really interesting. It's a whole different problem space. Like yeah. I, I, I really take my hat off to the people who do iOS hacking all the time because it's, it's, it's a whole different beast compared to Android. I honestly think Android is quite a bit easier. Um, so stepping off of that, actually, um, lots of people reach out. They always want to be getting into mobile hacking. Um, I'm sure this is something that people probably ask you as well, but what do you have any tips or recommendations or things that you would suggest to people who are new to, maybe they're, they're experienced hackers, but they're new to mobile hacking and they don't really know where to start. Um, I would recommend like uh, taking all old application like disclo- and also disclosed vulnerabilities and trying to reproduce some vulnerabilities, checking logs, checking what's going on and like uh, touching the vulnerability with your hands. But uh, I think it's like uh, like a bit harder to get into mobile security because when you hack in web, you can uh, like put XSS vector like super easy and you don't know to uh, to know like many things. But when you hack uh, uh, mobile applications, you need to, to know like uh, Android context or iOS context, and uh, you need to read the sources and uh, like additionally, uh, you need to read uh, the compiled sources. And sometimes it's harder than reading like a normal, not obfuscated sources. And that's why there are like uh, a number of things you need to learn before you get successful in mobile hacking. And it uh, would uh, take some time. And it would take like a lot of efforts from a person who wants to start mobile hacking. But um, if uh, this hill is uh, passed, uh, then you will be getting like a lot of money from bug bounties because like uh, everyone is vulnerable and there are a lot of uh, uh, vulnerabilities and uh, there are like uh, <laughs> maybe five person c- competing with you co- and if you compare it to web uh, bug bounties uh, <laughs> there are like 500 people competing <laughs> with you <laughs> So true. That's and, and that hasn't really changed much either. When I first got into bug bounty, everybody was like, "Oh, you you do mobile hacking? Like you should you should hack on mobile because nobody does mobile hacking." And uh, yeah. you know, five <laughs> years later, <laughs> it's very little has changed. So so yeah, absolutely. I'll totally echo that. Um, I love that that piece that you mentioned about uh, like retesting vulnerabilities. Do do you have uh, any ways that you identify? you know, old, old reports or stuff that people have published is, are you on Twitter a lot? Like where, where do you find, uh, reports to, to go read and reproduce? Um, I believe there are a lot of, uh, GitHub repositories that contain links, uh, to like different disclosed vulnerabilities, uh, to articles and, uh, like a person needs to like check, Maybe uh, they don't understand everything immediately, but uh, it's like you reading something, understanding something, and then coming again and, and, and again and again in, in the loop until you get everything. Awesome. Had you ever done any Java programming before you started hacking on mobile? Um, uh, like... Uh, the simple answer is no, uh, but uh, when I was like a schoolboy, I was... Uh, like. Uh, I wanted to like to create a, a lot of projects, uh, and I, let's say I, I didn't know anything about torrents. So I was like uh, ten years old, and I wanted to create like <laughs> my own website. Uh, so it, it, it had to be completely free, uh, no licenses, no everything, and, and uh, like people, uh, people freely share like their stuff uh, on that website. <laughs> <laughs> and then I know that uh, torrents exist and there are a lot of uh, such websites, but um, I was uh, really passionate about this idea and I, I don't know why, but uh, I thought uh, that I need to learn PHP and C++. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting selection yeah. of, of languages. <laughs> So those yep. are your first two, and then you kind of just, yeah, I, I think one of the one of the really ch- challenging th- things about mobile is that it's, uh, especially Android, like you kind of almost need to know how to read code. You you don't necessarily need to know how to write it, but being able to read and understand what a, a code snippet is doing is really really important, especially for the deeper types of 
vulnerabilities that we're talking about, not just AI or API, uh, you know, scanning or looking at the requests in Burp or whatever, but actually finding like figuring out what the app is doing um, requires some some level of understanding, and I think that could be a big hurdle. Uh, do you ever have to spend time like learning about new, so like for instance, Kotlin? Did you have to? S- do a deep dive on how Kotlin works and stuff in order to to figure that out? Or did you kind of just adapt your tooling to figure out, you know, what does Kotlin look like at the end of compilation and just, you know, make it work with how it is? Um, I think I never adopted uh, the scanner to Kotlin because uh, when Kotlin is compiled to uh, Dalvik uh, bytecode, then it's decompiled to Java code, and it's like uh, it's the same to like uh, normal mm-hmm. Java code, but uh, with a lot of uh, different checks and uh, like uh, Kotlin stuff. But uh, it's not important from a vulnerability detection perspective. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, there are a lot of like uh, synthetic classes. Uh, closures that are compiled to Java classes uh, and uh, they, they look like uh, uh, like a complete mess when they are decompiled. But anyway, it's not a big problem for vulnerability detection. Nice. Okay. That, that's really cool. Ben, I'd love to, I'd love to pick your brain uh, in depth about how, how your whole product works, but I don't want to, I don't want to bore people and, uh, and have to bleep <laughs> out a bunch of the, this episode. So um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave the super technical stuff for off air, but um, cool, man. I, I think that was like most of the questions that I had. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to sort of shout out or um, any, you know, your company, your website, your Twitter, anything like that? Um. You can add uh, links to my profiles in uh, your podcast, <laughs> so we, Absolutely. you'll have all um, all the bingo, Twitter, website, and the blog. <laughs> Perfect. Also, Perfect. we can add like some most popular repositories that contain uh, like uh, a set of uh, disclosed vulnerabilities, a set of articles. Uh, there are like many my uh, vulnerabilities and my, many my articles, but anyway, there are like like. Uh, um, a lot of uh, different ones, so you can share it with the guys, and they can start the mobile ha- hacking. Awesome, perfect. Yes, we'll we'll put those links uh, down in the description. Um, you can find uh, links to Baggy Pros uh, profiles, the Overskirt website, um, the Overskirt blogs, a bunch of blog posts, uh, and and mobile security write ups. And uh, if mobile hacking is something that you're looking to get into, that is an awesome place to start. Uh, like I said, there those are some of the best mobile hacking resources that are out there, especially that are like up to date and modern and bug bounty focused and that kind of stuff. So, um, awesome dude. It, this was, uh, this was, this was great. I know it's early over in, uh, in Asia or Japan or wherever, wherever you're currently at right now. So I appreciate you waking up uh, at the crack of dawn <laughs> and, uh, chugging two coffees before, <laughs> before you got, you got on here to, to talk with me and, uh, hopefully you could get a little more sleep after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I woke up, uh, I couldn't talk like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, you joined and you were like, work, I just woke up 10 work. minutes ago. I was like, do, do you want to get a coffee? You're like, y- yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna go to the coffee <laughs> shop. I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, because yesterday I landed at uh, 1 a.m. And I woke up uh, at uh, 7.50 a.m. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> then you, you you should go back to sleep. Uh, you you done enough brain dumping of mobile security. So. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sergey. It was awesome talking talking with you. All right. Peace. Bye.